What if on this episode, we predict the future? What is up, imaginary friends? Yes, as I said in the intro before the stinger, or the stinger before the intro, whichever, I do plan to predict the future in this episode. Now, how and why and about what? Well, it's all very specific. I plan to use the Pokemon trading card game release schedule for the past 10 years, 11 years, to say that Pokemon Generation 9 will be released by the end of this year. How and why do I make that claim? It's all in the data. And yes, sincerely, I have a lot of placards here that I've written out just to say I have information. So let's break this down. Joel, get ready with a graphic button. Not, not like it's graphic content, but like a button that pops up graphics. Yeah. Like I said, if we start at the beginning of Generation 5, back in black and white, we can see the seeds being sown and sprinkled out over the field for them to grow of just how we know that Generation 9 will be here possibly by this time next year. We start, like I said, in the TCG, which is where most of this information will be based. There's a few things that will be external of the trading card game that is in Pokemon Go, but most of this will be because of the trading card game. So Black and White started in 2011, and that generation of cards ran through 2013. Now, I would like to notify, I would like to call this era, if you will, the dawn of the modern era. Why would I call it that? Because a lot of things changed and a lot of things began to appear in the era of black and white that had not been so previously in the golden generation, if you will. Uh, Gen 1 cards still have a beautiful, beautiful history to them and a beautiful vision. I mean, just look at this Flareon. That's a beautiful card. Like, that, that's one of the most beautiful cards they've ever made. And that was in the first set. So, Yes, black and white is the dawn of the modern area. If you look at how even the cards were ordered back in the day, they put all the rares at the top. Like the first one was 01 of the set and then the next one was 02 and they were both rares and they were both holographics. But in black and white, things changed. The order of the card went now by type and not by rarity. You started out every set now, grass types. Here's all of your grass types. Here's all of your grass types. Then here's all of your fire types followed by water, electric, et cetera, et cetera. Not only were they ordered by types, but new forms began to be revealed in black and white, such as reverse hollows uh, and Pokemon abilities rather than Poke bodies. If you look at any cards back in the day, you'll see maybe a Poke body, but then it kind of morphed into just abilities. And those abilities are still used today. Now let's break down the sets because the sets began to tell really the big overall story. And this is actually how it first came across this idea that Generation 9 will be released next year, especially in the trading card game. I believe February, pick a Friday in February of 2023, Generation 9's first set will be released in the trading card game. And that starts, like I said, with black and white, because black and white was comprised of 12 different individual sets that existed over the three year period. And now three of those sets were special sets. And we'll get to those in a second because they almost exist outside of the formula that Pokemon has used over the last, you know, 11 years. These 12 sets were comprised in one of two ways. Like I said, it depends on where you put those special sets. You can see the four sets of three or three sets of four. And I would almost argue it's really four sets of three because they all follow um, this trilogy type basis. Now, just follow me here as we maybe flash up icons on the screen. And here we go. So black and white base set started in April of 2011. Now, if I give a date, I want it to be known that I pulled all of these dates from Cerebi.net. Uh, it is a fantastic source for all things Pokemon. So the base set of black and white debuted in April of 2011, followed by Emerging Powers and Noble Victories. This really comprised the base trilogy that uh, started black and white. And I say this was a base trilogy because it was a lot of the introduction of those abilities uh, of the new Pokemon of Unova. If I'm not mistaken, Pikachu was the only Pokemon not of Unova to appear in those first three sets of black and white. And then you have the next trilogy. It starts with Next Destinies, then goes to Dark Explorers, and finishes with Dragons Exalted. You can just call this, I guess, the X trilogy because, I mean, I have nothing better else to call it. And if you look at the logos for each one of the sets, they all have an X in it and it's highlighted and, and, and there's that. So you have the X trilogy, then you have the Dragon's Vault special set. You set that to the side, Dragon's Vaulted, or Dragon's Vaulted is a just a special set, it's a limited run. 
Uh, and you can see there's just unique cards that will be found in it. It highlights the dragon type cards. And that's that set. And then you have this weird set, Boundaries Crossed. Uh, it, I guess, crosses between the X Trilogy and the next trilogy, which is the Plasma Trilogy. This is where Team Plasma appeared in the Black and White series that ran for those three years. Black and White uh, then began putting out uh, Team Plasma cards like this one, or this one, that clearly had Team Plasma written on it, and that was kind of the theme for that year's set. If you look at the dates for that set, Plasma Storm, Plasma Freeze, and Plasma Blast all came out in 2013. Plasma Storm in February, Plasma Freeze in May, and then Plasma Blast in August. Now, those months will become important because throughout the rest of our timeline, with one exception, Pokemon releases a core set every February, May, August, and November. Now, hardcore fans will know that, but if you're watching this and you're not really into the TCG and you're just clicked on this because you just thought, hey, maybe this guy actually knows something. Maybe he's a creep that lives in his mother's basement that has access to the inside workings of Game Freak. I do not. But it is midnight and I am in my dining room and I need sleep. But these three sets were the final culmination of Black and White, with the exception of the final set that came in Black and White, and that was Legendary Treasures. But Legendary Treasures that came out, again, November of 2013, November 8th of 2013, uh, was a special set. And it was a special set because it was a reprint set. It took a world tour, a final brand finale, if you will, of black and white, comprised it into one set and said, here you go, this is how we're going out, we're going out with a bang. Here is black and white. Now let us look at X and Y. Black is white, it's over, it's in the past, it's 2014. We're looking at generation six of Pokemon and all the wonderful things that fall from X and Y. X and Y's card sets run from 2014 through 2016, another three year period. The base set for Pokemon X and Y appears in February of 2014 on February 5th. In this set, we again find a lot of new things. We're introduced to fairy types for the first time in the trading card game. It had been in the video games, but now it was in the playing card game. Uh, we also are introduced to mega evolutions in the trading card game. We had had some special things in the past. We had some very powerful cards before, but now we were taking them to the extreme. We were taking them to the mega level. And that was a departure from where they were in black and white. They were finding new ways to step up and increase the playability. And some people liked it and some people didn't. And as we looked at X and Y and we looked to their card sets and we began to look at how they broke down, how they were set apart in different time zones, how they're time zones, different years, that's what we call those things. X and Y's generation of Pokemon cards is really the most confusing. And if you just follow me through the order, you can see why, because how we viewed uh, black and white as trilogies, X and Y doesn't have those, but it does. It depends whether you classify one special set as a special set or not, because if it's not a special set, it fits in the tetralogy. Yeah, that's a real word. The tetralogy of three tetralogies existing or sets of four existing in X and Y, but it is definitely a special set. So it really doesn't belong in a base format. It doesn't belong in a standard set format like we classify all the others. So there's like three trilogies, but the special sets really mess up. Uh, honestly, X and Y and how they're distribu uh, distributed. So like with anything, we start with the base. I've already mentioned that. February of 2014 was the base set, followed by what I call the XY trilogy. And I call it that because it was very much based around the XY video game. You have this deliberated set. You have Flash Fire, Furious Fist, and Phantom Forces that came out in May, uh, May 7th, August 13th, and November 15th. Uh, of 2014 that completed the first year of XY. And in completing the first year of XY, it also completed X and Y. It completed that time frame where it focused on the initial release of the video game and it moved on to Omega Ruby and Alpha, uh, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire because the first set of 2015 was Primal Clash. When it debuted in February of 2015, it showcased this beautiful fight between Kyogre and Groudon and it showcased this beautiful landscape of what the future of Pokemon would be for that year of focusing on Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire and how that this game was now going to be the base for the next sets 
going forth. And this is where the tetralogy gets really confusing because you start out with Primal Clash, normal, average, set, boom, it's here. We have a focal point, we got a direction. And then Double Crisis comes along. Double Crisis was a very much a special set. It, it, it's not argued, it's, it's there as a special set. It debuts in March of 2015. And that's what you'll learn about the special sets. They don't follow that same two, five, eight, eleven 11 format of the regular standard sets. No, this special set of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, Double Crisis, just plops out in March. And like I said, you'll see that later on in uh, later generations too, these special sets. Roaring Skies comes in in May, and then Ancient Origins comes in in August to really complete this Oris Trilogy rather than Tetralogy because you can't count Double Crisis as a uh, standard set. It has to be classified as a special set. So that completes the Oris cycle. And then comes the break cycle, the break trilogy, the break tetralogy. I, I really don't know. Pokemon had a formula and they used it pretty much in X and Y, but then they began to break down because Breakthrough debuted in November of 2015. So to, it wasn't a new year, but it was a, a new cycle for Pokemon. They had left behind Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and they looked at this new format. They looked at this new mechanic in the game where it was these break cards, like the ones you see here on the screen, that had their own unique rule set, and you had to have uh, a special play uh, style for it, and, and it just refocused and reshaped the landscape of the TCG. So you started with Breakthrough in November of 15, and then in February of 16, break point came through. It, it became uh, just synonymous with the game at this point. We're gonna have these break cards. This is gonna be what it is. And then in the same month, Generations came out. Generations was the 20th anniversary set that very much just like the celebration set that we just had at the time of the recording, that is, uh, that celebrated the anniversary of Pokemon. And so that obviously was a special set. And then break returns with Fates Collide in May. And that was the weird thing. They were finishing this cycle with Fates Collide, not a Breaks Collide, which obviously wouldn't be the name because that sounds really weird, but they end with Fates Collide and it just kind of floats off into the ether. Because what we see happening next in August is Steam Siege. Now, while I say X and Y has this problem with tetralogies or trilogies and how we compute them, the base set can be put in with Flash Fire, Phantom Forces, and Furious Fist to create this base XY tetralogy. And then if you included Double Crisis in the Aorus tetralogy, you would have four to make it not a trilogy. But then you have Breakthrough, Breakpoint, Fates Clod, and Steam Siege, which Steam Siege was the final set. It was the closing chapter to X and Y in the TCG. And it really didn't fit that break cycle. Now, I'm not saying it didn't have its own input, into the format. No, it, it did. It very much did. It just doesn't fit because X and Y ends on a special set. One of the most popular ones, at least in the past year, and that's XY Evolutions. It's almost like Pokemon gave up on X and Y. It's like they gave up on Gen 6 halfway through the TCG cycles. But where Pokemon really lost their way in X and Y and Gen 6, they firmly established themselves in Generation 7 when Sun and Moon came out in 2017. Sun and Moon, to me, in retrospect, is the set I probably like the most because I'm still trying to find cards from it. I'm still trying to find Elite Trainer boxes that are sealed that I can open myself, that I can pull out and go, boom, here's my Elite Trainer box from Sun and Moon, this perfect establishment of a trading card game and then I get the pleasure of opening. Now, I came back to collecting when Rebel Clash came out in Generation 8, and we'll get there in a moment, but it immediately sent shockwaves backwards for me to go back through Gen 7, to go back to the Sun and Moon era and go, where are these cards? Where are these Elite Trainer boxes? Where are these promos? Where are these packages that I can get a hold of so that I can look through the stories that are being told in these cards that are uh, being established even in the sets, in the releases, and how they're depicted. The artwork on the cardboard sleeves are even a telltale sign of how when Generation 7 hit, Pokemon just, they finally caught fire to what they needed to do 
to make these cycles perfect. And like with the previous set, Sun and Moon brought in its own mechanic. It brought in its own catch to the trading card game. It brought in GX replacing EX. It even replaced Megas, which I, I don't know if they were a success. I wasn't playing at the time. I wasn't a competitor at all, especially, nor have I been since. But the beauty of what these GXs then began to do because we saw the artwork of these cards began to unfold to what they are today. And what they are today is probably some of the best artwork that's being put on Pokemon cards, period. Yeah, I know I ranted about that Flareon at the beginning, but today's modern cards found their basis in Sun and Moon. This was like the rebirth of the playing card games. And it starts in 2017, when it starts with the 2017 Tetralogy, which focused on the Sun and Moon video games, which came out the November before. So if we look at the base set that debuted in February, it was the start, like I said, of the Sun and Moon Tetralogy, which included Guardians Rising in May 5th of that year, Burning Shadows August 4th, and then Crimson Invasion on November 3rd of 2017. These four comprised the first year of the Sun and Moon era. It comprised the Sun and Moon Tetralogy, and in it there was also Shining Legends that came out in October of that year, which is a set that people are still trying to find and buy and open today. Uh, Shining Legends was a special set that was setting the tone for what special sets would then become, and we'll see that even in the Sun and Moon era. In 2018, the focus from Sun and Moon then shifted to Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, which had come out at the end of 2017. And in the 2018 Tetralogy, in the Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon Tetralogy, in the Ultra Tetralogy, if you will, you had Ultra Prism in February, you had Forbidden Light in May, you had Celestial Storm in August, and you had Lost Thunder in November. These sets just, again, like I said a while ago, you can see the card art, the, the, the cardboard on the sleeve that you get in the store, they each showed uniformity. The 2017 had the same border, 2018 had the same border, and 2019 had the same border. Yes, Dragon Majesty came out, and I'm not even touching these special sets because I've already overwhelmed the idea that these special sets do not belong in the Tetralogy, they're special. So I'm not gonna make another big deal about it. 2019 comes the last of the 16 sets uh, of Sun and Moon appear. It starts with Team Up, which again shook up the landscape of what the TCG was because now you had Tag Team GX Pokemon and it just began to focus, if you look through the teams, a lot on Kanto. And why was that? Because Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee came out the year before. And so now 2019 is a focal set a lot on Kanto because it wants to pull out these Pokemon that they're playing in the video games and say, here's a card that has this Pokemon. Also, this is still generation seven. So here's a sprinkling of these Alolan Pokemon. Here's a sprinkling of all these legendaries that we want you to be familiar with because they're still important to the game. They're still important to the culture. So you have Team Up in February. You have Pokemon Ted Pikachu in March of that year. Uh, you have Unbroken Bonds in May. A Unified Minds in August, Hidden Fates, the special set in September, and then Cosmic Eclipse to end out the year and to close out with the largest set at that time, the largest expansion of the TCG in one era. The Sun and Moon era established the model for what Pokemon would do in the TCG. And that's why it's important when we come to Generation 8. Now, Generation 8 is the currently playing cycle that we're in. We're in Generation 8 Pokemon. It's been Sword and Shield for three years now because Sword and Shield debuted in 2020 and the mind of the Pokemon community went to this new region to Galar. And with it went the TCG when the debut of V Pokemon and V Max Pokemon started our world ablaze uh, with the base set of Sword and Shield in February of 2020. Now, V was present and has been present throughout all three years, but now in year three, as we anticipate the arrival of Brilliant Stars in the English, we get V Stars, which is the culmination, I believe, at least, because this is where we begin to transition from data that we can look at to speculation that we get into. Uh, v Star is going to be the last model for this set of Pokemon cards. Who knows what will happen in Generation 9 if they continue V-Star over there? I doubt it. It just doesn't seem to be the precedent for the last four generations. So let's get into it. We've already said that Sword and Shield brought in the Dawn of V, V-Max, and V-Star Pokemon. V are still present 
uh, throughout all three years. The V Max, though, in 2022, seems to have disappeared. The V Maxes have been replaced by V Stars. We only have one set to look at. Well, Star Birth in Japan, which will bleed heavily into Brilliant Stars in English. Star Birth is being released in January of this year, and Brilliant Stars being released in English in February of this year. But we can see already that in Star Birth in Japan, there are no V Maxes. They're just Vs and V Stars. So it's really, I feel like, easy to conclude that V Max is over. That's why in the final set of 2022, I mean of 2021 in Japanese, the set was called VMAX Climax. It was the end. It was the highest point it was going to go because the next point was to the stars. Oh, I've been waiting for that joke. But if we look at what we do have before we get too much into speculation, currently, currently at the time of this filming, uh, there are 12 sets that comprise the Sword and Shield era of the Pokemon trading card game. Three of those 12 are special sets, so we just set them to the side immediately. Now, at this time, one more special set and one more standard set have been confirmed. Like I said, we're looking next month, Brilliant Stars coming out, uh, revolutionizing again with the V-Star system. And we know it's already been confirmed for English that in June of this year, we will receive a special set. But the following of the release schedule that we've seen in Sun and Moon, and we've seen so far in Sword and Shield, I feel like sets the tone. Uh, we've already looked at how every February, May, August and November of every year for the past 12 years or 11 years has shown us that every one of those months we're getting a standard set and that's been no different. In 2020 we got the base set for Sword and Shield in February of that year followed by Rebel Clash in May, Darkness Ablaze which is one of my favorite names of a card set. That came out in August of that year and August 14th and then Champion's Path the special set for the year came out in September following with Vivid Voltage in November. November 13th of 2020 was the last of the Sword and Shield Tetralogy for the premier sets of the Sword and Shield Generation 8 era. Because in 2021, it shifted from just Sword and Shield to the Sword and Shield DLC, which included the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra. And that is clearly seen in the sets that come out. But this is where we get our one hiccup. And if we think about when this happened, I, I think it's easy to blame the global pandemic on this because in February of 2021, we did not get a standard set, we got a special set. We got Shining Fates in February, which we know belongs to the standard sets, but it didn't happen that way. In 2021, things flipped. The Shining Fates came out in February of 2021, and then the first standard set of 2021 debuted in March. Battle Styles came out, followed by Chilling Rain, not in May, but in June. And this is where things shift back to normal. Evolving Skies came out on schedule in August, and Fusion Strike came out on schedule in November with the celebration set that we've already talked about, the 25th anniversary set, coming out in October of 2021. So if we take in consideration the global pandemic and just shift a few dates there, if we flip flop Shining Fates and Battle Styles, we have their normal schedule with the exclusion of Chilling Rain coming out a little bit later than normal. But again, with everyone shut down, with printing being stopped for as long as it was, when people weren't able to work for as long as they were, uh, the fact that Shining Fates came out in February of that year, that they still had cards coming out on the dates they were sort of exposed to, is really impressive uh, for a company as a whole. And so we see those things happening. We see it get off, but with a great excuse and then get back on track because again, Brilliant Stars set to premiere uh, in February of 2022 on February 25th, the last Friday of February of this year. And we also know, like I said, we have a, another special set coming out in June of 2022 that's been confirmed by the Pokemon Company. And then this is where we get into speculation. This is also where we look to the Japanese sets a lot more so than I mentioned because the Japanese sets tell everything that we need to know, honestly, about the English sets. So if we look now to what we see in the Japanese side of the market versus the English side of the market, we can really begin to see the pattern that's set before us. There have already been trademarks filed in Japan that in the times past have been the earliest intel for what sets may be upcoming. Let me just go through the current trademarks that exist. We have Time Gazer and Space Shuggler. Now, Pokemon Legends Arceus debuts in January of 22, Brilliant Stars comes out in February 22, and the mascot Pokemon for Brilliant Stars is who? Arceus, and it focuses blatantly on Sinnoh and Arceus. 
which is what the Diamond Pearl remakes were in November of 21, which is what is the focal point of Pokemon Legends Arceus in 22. And so we're literally looking at this year being a year of Sinnoh, a year of Gen 4, a year of focusing on the Pokemon from that region. And then we get into these trademarks, which has Time Gazer and Space Juggler. It's really clear to see that that is both Dialga and Ponkyo respectively, and they're gonna have their twin sets debut probably sometime in April, I think, in the uh, Japanese market. And then in May, we'll get whatever set that turns into in English. Now, that's not confirmed that those two sets will combine to be one set, but we have grand precedent for that. I just look back at Chilling Rain that came out in 21. We had Jet Black Spirit and Silver Lance that combined became Chilling Rain for the majority uh, of all their compositions. We've seen before with three sets become one, where Evolving Skies that came out towards the end of 2021, it was comprised of EV Heroes, Blue Sky Stream, and Towering Perfection in the Japanese. Now, Blue Sky Stream and Towering Perfection was a twin set. They came out and debuted simultaneously on the market, so it was like one half of the sets. And even how they're identified is reminiscent of how the fact that they're one half each of the same set. EV Heroes was a complete set by itself, but it was included both honestly in Evolving Skies, but then in Fusion Strike later on because some cards went better with Fusion Strike, which was a heavy focus on Psychic Pokemon. So like Espeon got put there and there were some other cards that just, they didn't say we want to put them in Evolving Skies, we want to save them for Fusion Strike. So we see these sets combining. And like I said, while this is not confirmed, while we cannot land 100% on this, I feel like we can 99% land on it. So 1% margin of error, right? So Time Gazer Space Juggler, that is going to be the May set in English. And after Time Gazer and Space Juggler, we still have three more trademarks to look at because we have Lost Abyss, Dark Phantasma, and Incandescent Arcana, which is a ridiculous name, but at the same time, also exciting. Now to look at each one of those, you have to break them down and go, okay, if we're looking at Sinnoh, if we're looking at Gen 4, what are we looking at? Lost Abyss can give kind of the thought mindset of Giratina. Uh, I know there have been other commentators on YouTube. My mind goes to PTCG Radio, who talks about Lost Abyss, the idea of the Lost Zone, which has been seen incrementally in uh, throughout the TCG. It's appeared before, and it's appeared f uh, very few times, but anytime a set has had a Lost in the name, looking back at Lost Thunder, one being one of the last ones, it's had a Lost Zone. So looking at Lost Abyss, might have a Lost Zone, might not. That's just speculation, but that Lost Abyss could point to Giratina, while Dark Phantasma could point to Dark Rai, or Dark Ray. I'm not gonna argue pronunciations. There's official pronunciations, and I don't know them all, because while I'm a nerd making a video at midnight about Pokemon trading cards and using math and statistics and data to say when the next generation is gonna come out, I'm not that big of a nerd. And then looking at Incandescent Arcana, uh, how we derived who that's about, uh, there have been speculation that Incandescent is a reference to Cresselia being, you know, the moonlight Incandescent, the glowing, and it's the moon Pokemon. And then Arcana, uh, I don't know Japanese, I don't know the word that was used for it, but some have said there's ties to Heatran, and I'm just going to choose to believe the internet for once. But it makes sense. You have Cresselia, you have Heatran, they're both part of Gen 4, they're both spotlighted, and why not put them there? Uh, Shaman, to make this note, is featured also in Brilliant Stars in in the English more so than Japanese. In the Japanese card sets, they have one pack art, and in Japanese for Starbirth, the pack art was just this. It was Ar Arceus on the cover, and that was on every cover. In English, you get four different pack arts, and Shaman is one of the four, along with Charizard and. Oh no, Whimsicott. It was Charizard and Winslet and they were the other V-Stars that came out in the set, so it makes sense that they get the pack arts because they're the future Pokemon, but Shaman is included there with Arceus and Broken Stars. So if we want to look for Shaman, it's already been used. Now, these, again, can only spill to some of the sets to be released. I'm expecting fully that there's a Sword and Shield 10 set that comes out again in May, probably the Time Gazer Space Shuggler set. There's a Sword and Shield 11 that comes out in August. There's a Sword and Shield set 12 that will come out in November. I've already said that we have uh, using, again, the Japanese Battle Legion, uh, which is right now just a trademark, but yet they've also confirmed that it will be released in June of 2022 in English as a special set. That's all the information that I know of at the time about that set. So there's our special set of the year, at least one. And I wouldn't be surprised if in like, there's a second special set, maybe an 
because every time there's a 0.5, it's a special set. If they want to do something a la like Evolutions, which I would love for them to do an Evolutions of just Diamond and Pearl. Uh, I, I, personally, I, I would dig that. I said that on this channel like a year ago. I want an Evolutions of Gen 4. Maybe they'll make it happen. I don't know. And if they do make it happen, I'm going to take credit like nobody's business. Nonetheless, Generation 8 will end in November of this year in the TCG with Sword and Shield set 12, really concluding the Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, Pokemon Legends, Arceus, Tetralogy. And then in February of 23, we get the first set of Gen 9, which means though, we would get the Gen 9 game in November of 22. There's some corners of the internet that begin to speculate that we'll know whether we're getting Gen 9 this year by as late as April or as early as April, depending on which way you're looking at it. I'm looking at February, going to like announce something in February. There is the Pokemon Day at the end of February. It's their big reveal day. They've used it before. That's how they revealed Sword and Shield, if I'm not mistaken. So they could, at the end of February, I think anywhere between the end of February and the end of April, say, here's your first announcement for Generation 9. It comes out in November of this year because looking back, four out of the last seven, I think, Novembers have had a mainline game debut. And we're looking at Brilliant Diamond and Shine Pearl came out of November of 21. It wasn't a mainline game, but it was a mainline game. It was a remake, and that's had its place. Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon came out in November. A remake, but an enhancement. It gets really weird because Black and White, Black and White 2, is it a sequel? That one was. Is Ultra Sun a sequel? People debate. Is Brilliant Diamond and Shine Pearl a remake? Yes, but is it a mainline game? Yes, it, it fits the narrative. So we had this mainline game in November of this year, and we've had back-to-back -back years with mainline games before. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon came a year after Sun and Moon. And so now, 22, why not have in November, Generation 9 debut, and in February of next year, the first set of Generation 9 in the TCG. And I think this point is backed up strongly, starting way back with Black and White, but especially when it hits Sun and Moon, because for the last five years, the Pokemon company has been very consistent with their trading card game. And all these previous sets, Black and White, X and Y, Sun and Moon, Sword and Shield so far, have all had three years in the sun, no pun intended. So why not, at the end of 22, we finish the Sword and Shield era of Pokemon and walk boldly into whatever Italian, Californian internet speculation of the new generation that we'll have and see a whole new world of Pokemon. Breaking news. Okay, so let's try this. Uh, since the first filming of this video, two new pieces of information have come out that really just add to the saturation of things already mentioned here. Uh, one is that of the Battle Legion or Battle Region or Battle Legion or Battle Region, depending on who you ask, um, has been revealed. We got some new Vs like Starmie V and Garchomp V, and those are really cool. And Battle Legion is now on the books. It'll be released February 25th, same day Brilliant Stars is in America. So that's pretty neat. Uh, the second bit of information that's come out since the recording of the rest of this video is uh, another trademark. Um, it is called, uh, which is, I, I love this name. I, I'm, not, I'm not bluffing on this. I, I absolutely love it. Paradigm Trigger. What does that mean? If anything, what I really hope that it is, allegedly this may be the set that would end up being in um, August for us. So it may be a little early for this. I don't know. It's going to be weird how this year unfolds, I'm sure. But Paradigm Trigger, uh, what that says to me is maybe a, um, a catch-up set. Like we had in black and white with Legendary Treasures, which was kind of like a reprint set. Uh, it'd be really nice if Paradigm Trigger turned out to be some kind of like recap of the entire Sword and Shield era of Gen 8 and because a lot of people think we won't be getting any more V-Maxes. There were no new V-Maxes in Starbirth, there were only V-Stars, which makes sense. There was Vs and V-Stars, but no V-Maxes, but this is the third year. This is a whole new schematic they want to branch away, but it would be really nice in Paradigm Trigger if they, because Paradigm is a, sh a shift of reality. Uh, there's a paradigm shift and this is the triggering event so maybe we'll have paradigm trigger and then we'll have alternate reality 
in which uh, all these sets kind of blur together and we'll get a revisit of some VMAXs later on, especially with some of the cards that were revealed and I won't get into it. Go watch PTCG Radio if you really want to get a breakdown of this. They do a great job. Look at Pokey Beach, uh, a source of information that I've used for this video. Uh, of course, Cerebi.net is the holy grail of information along with Bulbapedia. Uh, Bulbapedia and Cerebi are my two go-tos. Nonetheless, PTCG Radio really thinks that we're, uh, with Ross over there that uh, VMAXs are done, but he, he made a comment the other day that, you know, it kind of sparked something to me. Like, there's this one card, the new Halucha that comes out that targets, I think, VMAXs. And VMAXs alone, he made a point that, that that's only going to be good for about the next few months because eventually VMAXs are going to rotate off play to get fewer and fewer targets with that card as it goes on. I thought, but what if at the end of the year, there's a culmination set like Legendary Treasures that brings back some VMAXs that adds V-Stars and it says, okay, here's here's an actual set of cards that will be coinciding with this Halucha who targets VMAXs. So it gives it some more strength to that card. Those are two new, two new pieces of information that have dropped since I recorded the first mega set of this video. And I wanted to include these two because they are relevant. We get more information about Battle Legion and we get a new set name, uh, allegedly, uh, with Paradigm Trigger, but it's a set name. That's all I have for us in this video. It's probably the longest video that I've ever done for this channel. And I don't know if you've stayed to the end, but if so, leave your comments down below about what you think Gen 9 will be, where it will be located. Like I said, there's a little Easter egg in the black black diamond in the brilliant diamond shining pearl remakes of the game director saying ciao and some people have said well gen 9 is going to be in italy based which quite frankly i would love i mean that would be in europe and two generations back to back but it's italy i mean you got everything from mountains to venice to rome uh, i would really hope the water type starter would be like this lion gladiator type or even even this would be fantastic to me a porcupine water Pokemon and its quills were like Roman spears and that just says I've been up to long. so leave your comments down below and until Matt until next time I'm gonna go take a nap keep the imagination alive